our lecture today is devoted to genome-wide association studies, and as you already know, these are the kinds of studies that help us separate genetic variations that are biologically insignificant from those that do produce a change that ultimately uh, might be either detrimental or advantageous to an individual. And study of these um, variations are also critical to identifying what genes are responsible for a particular genetic or genomic disorder, as we learned in last week's lecture by Lynn Jordy. Uh, there's also a much more practical reason to study these genetic variations, particularly the single nucleotide polymorphisms that give rise to the subtle differences between each and every one of us in this hall, since a thorough understanding of these variations might provide some sort of a key way of knowing in advance how someone might uh, respond to a particular drug or treatment regimen. Uh, so to today's lecture, I'm very pleased to introduce you to you Dr. Karen Mulkey, who will be presenting today's lecture on genome-wide association studies. Uh, Dr. Mulkey is an NHGRI alumna, having done her postdoctoral work in Francis Collins Laboratory, where she used genome-wide approaches to locate, localize, excuse me, diabetes susceptibility genes. Uh, she is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of North Carolina and a member of the Carolina Center for Genome Sciences. Her lab is actively studying complex traits with complex inheritance patterns using many of the, pro the approaches that she will be describing to you in today's lecture. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mulkey back to the NIH campus this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoy the opportunity to, uh, to come back to NHGRI and to the NIH and to see a lot of old friends. So today, I am going to talk about uh, genome-wide association studies uh, and their applications and uh, uses. And primarily, I'm focused on genome-wide associations as they apply to understanding the variants that uh, lead to complex traits. And by this, I mean the traits that uh, um, are the result of many genetic factors as well as environmental factors uh, and perhaps their interactions. Uh, for which not a single, uh, perhaps not a single gene is responsible for the trait, but the combination of those. This means that some of the factors that are involved have a relatively subtle effect, and so the identification of these, uh, of these genetic factors um, uh, can be achieved using these genome-wide association studies. When we think about the role of the type of variants, the type of genetic factors that are going to be able to be identified by genome-wide association studies, we consider the difference between common and rare DNA variants. And uh, to illustrate that, I show you here some examples of a stretch of chromosome uh, 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 identified in an in individual. <clears throat> um, when we look at these across many different individuals, you can see that most of the nucleotides are identical. Uh, however, there are some positions where there's, uh, the, the, there's a single nucleotide polymorphism. For example, here a T, where in a, um, another copy of that chromosome there's an A. This is a relatively common uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. There are both T's and A's present uh, uh, in a countable number of times. Some DNA variants are, are uh, more rare. For example, this variant here, there's a C nucleotide present in most copies of that chromosome and only much less frequently is an alternate allele, for example, a G allele present. When examining the genetic architecture, the genes that influence uh, traits and diseases, uh, different strategies have different uh, potential power to identify uh, the underlying genetic variants. So the common and rare variants that I just described are shown here sort of on the x-axis with the allele frequency. Uh, shown uh, here, if allele frequency greater than about 5% uh, uh, considered a common allele, uh, the more uh, slightly lower frequency variants, uh, when getting down to frequencies where the variant is observed uh, uh, with a frequency of 0.005 or less, we're down into the rare category. The, uh, the frequency of variance in consideration compared to the effect size uh, helps us determine what kind of a strategy is going to be most powerful. This is uh, the, the, the stronger the effect of the DNA variant on causing disease, uh, the higher it would be present on this axis. So a, a single gene disorder where a single variant uh, causes, uh, has a definite cause to the disease uh, would, would be up here. So rare alleles causing a Mendelian disease uh, uh, are present here on the graph whereas 
the common variants that are, that are able to be detected by the methods we're gonna talk about today um, are, uh, are shown here by genome-wide association studies. So there are common disease variants that we are not gonna be able to detect using these methods. Uh, and there are uh, other rare variants that are um, also going to be difficult to discover through this strategy. Okay, so as we talk about genome-wide association studies today, we're gonna talk about what the goal of these studies is, these studies are, and then go through how the studies are performed. Uh, then discuss what we can learn from the associated regions and look through some examples of uh, the type of data that uh, comes out of the uh, of, a, of association scan, and then talk a, a little about what the findings can tell us about, uh, about disease. So the goal of genome-wide association studies is to identify these genetic factors that underlie, uh, underlie diseases um, or common traits. Now the benefits of doing this kind of a strategy compared to classical mapping strategies. Now by classical mapping I mean uh, uh, linkage analysis strategies, often genome-wide linkage analysis strategies, or to do an association study with a candidate gene, a particular gene identified ahead of time that um, is thought to play a role in disease and to go examine just the, the DNA variation in that specific gene. So the benefits of doing a genome-wide association study compared to those techniques are that first it's more powerful than linkage uh, to identify the common low penetrance variants. These are the variants where uh, they're inherited both by individuals affected and not affected by that disease or that, um, uh, that's the low penetrance uh, and more powerful than uh, linkage strat strategies. They also provide better resolution than linkage strategies. When a, a peak is identified from a genome-wide association study, the, uh, the peak is likely closer to the underlying gene or genetic variant or defines that region to a much smaller portion of the genome than a linkage study does. And finally, there's no need to select uh, candidate genes. This means that this can be an unbiased approach. You don't have to know what the uh, molecular functions of the genes and what their roles are in the disease or trait uh, prior to beginning the study. This uh, uh, means that the strategy allows us to identify completely novel mechanisms of, uh, that, that I mean, may be playing a role. Now, the, the uh, requirement to do genome-wide association studies, these have been around for about four or five years or so. Uh, the, the things that were needed to make them possible include first a, a catalog of the human genetic variants. So after the uh, human genome was uh, sequenced, the, the strategies to identify the uh, DNA variants across the genome were implemented. That catalog was important. Uh, methods to allow low cost and accurate genotyping of many DNA variants uh, uh, together were needed, and those technologies have, have developed. We needed large numbers of informative samples, and the numbers of samples that are needed keep uh, seeming, seem to keep needing to be uh, increasing to identify additional variants, and so these um, uh, uh, study samples need to be collected. And finally, we need efficient statistical design and analysis tools to deal with the very large number of statistical tests uh, being performed um, to do these types of studies. So why do a genome-wide association study? The goal here is to test a large portion of the common uh, single nucleotide genetic variation in the genome for association with um, either a disease or variation in a quantitative trait. Um, as, I, as I described, the focus on the common variants is really um, a result of the, of the strategy of the, um, the tools that are available uh, right now to, to do these analyses. Um, in the future, genome-wide association studies will be possible for less and less common uh, variants. And the true goal is to find the disease or quantitative trait related variants um, without knowing ahead of time what the, without needing to know ahead of time. Uh, what the uh, what the genes do and how the how the variants might function. So we're going to talk through several of the steps involved in uh, performing a genome-wide association study, uh, both from the the start for collecting the samples, uh, performing the actual uh, 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 genotyping of the DNA samples, uh, performing quality control of that resulting genetic data the statistical analysis of the genotypes that result, uh, 
and the important steps of uh, replication and follow-up of the initial results of the genome-wide association scan. So first, thinking about the phenotype that's able to be uh, studied for doing a genome-wide association study. Uh, the disease, we could do a, a study that is um, a case control design, looking at individuals that are affected with a particular disease and compare them to individuals unaffected with that uh, particular disease. The disease might be uh, relatively rare or it might be much more common. It could be something that affects uh, um, only hundreds of individuals or it could be uh, 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 type 2 diabetes, for example, affecting um, 6 to 10 percent of the population. Genome-wide association studies also work for, uh, for quantitative traits uh, where there's a, um, a continuous distribution of the trait values. For example, looking at some, uh, looking for genes that influence uh, weight or body mass index or height, uh, uh, um, quantitative traits that can be uh, more focused and specific, such as coronary artery thickness. Uh, even genome-wide association studies can be formed using outcomes such as gene expression level obtained from uh, individual samples. So both qualitative and quantitative traits are amenable to uh, performing genome-wide association studies. When thinking about the case control design or when thinking about trying to identify uh, the variants that influence risk to disease, uh, one strategy is the case control design where one specifically um, tries to ascertain cases affected with disease and specifically tries to collect controls. Uh, another, an alternate strategy to trying to identify the variants that influence disease is to use a population cohort uh, where individuals from the, uh, representative of the entire population are ascertained and then those who are found to be affected with the disease are considered the cases, uh, whereas others are considered the controls. The population cohort approach uh, has, uh, uh, has the limitation that uh, fewer individuals are going to be uh, cases if only 10 percent of the population has the disease, then only 10 percent of the individuals collected are, um, um, fit that category. However, they may be a little bit more representative of the case population. Um, most case control studies that have been performed to date have, uh, uh, have ascertained specifically the cases separately from the controls. So an important aspect then to consider when looking at the results of such studies is uh, how was a case defined and how was a control defined, because that can influence interpretation of the results. <coughs> criteria, criteria can be used to increase the potential that genetic variants are going to be identified uh, uh, by selecting cases uh, that are uh, more likely to be harboring the genetic variants. So strategies to do this include identifying uh, more severely affected individuals uh, uh, who have um, maybe more complications of the disease. Uh, uh, um, we could require that other family members are affected with the disease. So choosing cases uh, from families where um, um, they're, they have a family history increases the opportunity that increases the chance that they have inherited genetic variants that are influencing disease as opposed to getting disease entirely from environmental factors. Uh, another choice could be to choose individuals that became affected with disease earlier on. If it's an older age of onset disorder, then uh, individuals affected earlier may have a, a greater genetic load and therefore um, include more genetic variants uh, able to be found. Strategies can also be used to try and increase the opportunity to find the genetic variants through the selection of the controls. So in an attempt to try and identify individuals that have low risk of disease uh, 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 um, rather than um, population-based samples. So if we were to choose just uh, members of the population as a whole to be controls for something like type 2 diabetes, then some fraction of the individuals may be affected with type 2 diabetes and not yet know it. Uh, or they might become affected with type 2 diabetes uh, in three months and uh, be carrying the genetic factors that might um, uh, cause them to be more likely to be a case, but we would be considering them a control at that point. In an attempt to try and um, uh, have the study be 
um, as well powered as possible. Individuals that have the same ancestry background as the cases are important. Uh, individuals can also be matched to the cases based on age, uh, sex, and demographics. To try and have the cases and controls be as similar as possible to each other, um, except for the genetic factors that uh, would uh, lead them to develop disease. An important uh, uh, aspect of looking at the, um, looking at the individuals and the uh, uh, ensuing analysis is that um, cases and controls in the end need to be matched for ancestry. Uh, that's um, indicated here by um, a few different um, types of symbols that represent different ancestral backgrounds. If the ratio of those different, if the contribution of those different ancestral backgrounds is different between the cases and controls, then any genetic factor that influences or that is um, uh, represented differently in those ancestral backgrounds could appear to be associated with disease and therefore be as, uh, uh, come out as a false positive uh, association. Samples that have unmatched ancestry might not be identified, might not be known to investigators prior to beginning the study. Um, the, the data that comes out, the genotype data uh, uh, obtained from the individuals can be used subsequently um, after genotyping to um, detect that uh, uh, ancestry might be mismatched between cases and controls and to try to uh, address that. So these are the, the, the mismatched ancestry, uh, um, a little bit more globally. We could uh, think of this as uh, population stratification, um, meaning that the populations, that there are subpopulations within the cases and controls, and if those subpopulations are of uh, different frequency, that that can influence the results. Uh, another similar issue is cryptic relatedness. If the individuals that are ascertained as cases are um, thought to be uh, independent and unrelated to one another, but in fact are actually um, uh, relatives of one another, then the assumptions of the statistical tests, the assumptions of independence that are used are then uh, violated. And this also can lead to a false positive evidence of association. And so one of the steps that's uh, performed on the, uh, the genotyping data is to try to identify whether uh, individuals are more related than um, than expected. One can then account for or try to avoid uh, these uh, population issues. Uh, one strategy is to uh, use an average, um, an average amount of, of um, uh, uh, to use an average measure to adjust the results of the association study. This is a genomic control parameter uh, that can be um, applied to the, uh, the resulting data. One could also try to identify the principal components of population substructure from the data, from the genotype data, and then use those uh, principal components as um, factors that are included and adjusted for in the analysis. Another strategy to avoid population stratification uh, would be to use family-based designs uh, where trios of individuals, parents and an affected child, are, are used and the um, uh, uh, entire study is performed within those trios. Now the, uh, a trio design uh, is a little bit less favored in many cases uh, just due to the cost and, and the, um, the relatively reduced power given the number of individuals that are needed to be genotyped, but it does alleviate uh, uh, any issues of population stratification. Okay, so once the uh, individuals have been collected, the samples have been uh, ascertained, the next step is to perform the genotyping on the DNA from those individuals. Um, in the, over the uh, development of genome-wide association studies, essentially this ends up meaning using uh, a standard panel of markers available uh, from, uh, uh, from companies. There are a couple companies that, that um, uh, are marketing these fixed content panels that are used the most frequently. These fixed content panels will have 10,000 to a million or more uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms present. And so essentially your choice uh, when performing a study like this is to determine which of these fixed content panels to perform. 
um, choosing a fixed content panel is much less expensive than going out and um, deciding which uh, particular DNA variants uh, uh, um, to, to test, given the, the large number of uh, the large number needed. So, two companies that uh, market these tests tests include uh, Affymetrics and Illumina. The strategies that they use to determine which variants are going to be on the uh, are present on these fixed content panels include one is looking at random SNPs located across the genome. Uh, second, to use uh, haplotype tag SNPs, uh, as Lynn Jordy mentioned last time and as that I'll show uh, in a moment. This is an attempt to select the variants that are most representative of the largest number of um, uh, uh, regions of variation in the genome uh, most efficiently. These panels also include probes that do not contain single nucleotide polymorphisms but uh, can be used to determine uh, uh, the presence of copy number through the intensity of the, um, uh, of the, of the signal that results from um, just looking for presence or absence of a particular probe. This is a description of uh, what selecting haplotype tag SNPs mean. And this is a strategy that uh, greatly reduces the number of variants that need to be tested on a chip and is really one of the strategies that made it possible to do uh, genome-wide association studies that look at a large proportion of the common variation in the genome uh, with a um, uh, relatively limited number of SNPs in that 300,000 uh, to million range. Uh, shown here are four examples of a particular stretch of chromosome and you can see there are three positions of uh, SNPs that are present. If all of those, uh, if these SNPs and those um, off to the sides are brought together and um, uh, shown into haplotypes, uh, what, what uh, we find in human populations is that there are a relatively limited number of haplotypes given the possible number that, uh, that could be present um, given two, uh, two variants at each of a number of different SNPs. So in this set of uh, SNPs that are present in this set of haplotypes, uh, there are um, uh, many different SNPs, but the entire information um, to determine whether an individual has inherited uh, 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 haplotypes one through four can be contained by just genotyping three of these SNPs. So uh, by choosing these three that are shown here uh, called tag SNPs, or there are many alternate uh, possibilities on this slide. Uh, different SNPs that could be, uh, that could represent, that could tag the same uh, haplotypes. By choosing this relatively limited set of uh, variants, uh, we can represent a much greater proportion of the total human genetic variation uh, uh, than, than would be required by typing every one of those SNPs. I'm going to talk briefly through the two main strategies uh, uh, available by Illumina and Affymetrics and what their method of uh, allelic discrimination is, determining which alleles are present uh, at a given SNP, whether a particular DNA sample is homozygous for one or the other allele or heterozygous. So uh, Illumina uses a strategy where uh, the, um, that includes capture of the DNA through um, bead arrays and uh, a small enzymatic uh, allele extension reaction, like a mini sequencing reaction. Uh, they've gone through a few different phases of uh, technologies uh, in precisely how that mini sequencing reaction happens. And the most recent technology is a single base extension where a probe uh, aligns to uh, the stretch of uh, DNA. So here's the stretch of DNA from the individual. A probe is designed that uh, uh, hybridizes and is um, complementary to a stretch of sequence right that, that ends right before the variant position. And the probe can then either be filled in with a, um, a T nucleotide here or, a, um, or another probe would have a, a G nucleotide available. Um, that mini sequencing reaction, the incorporation of the specific allele uh, uh, then allows that nucleotide to be um, detected through a through staining, through um, uh, a, ta a label, uh, to determine whether an individual has uh, one allele or the other, um, or, or both. Uh, 
here is shown two of the uh, versions of the, uh, this Infinium uh, technology. This is the Infinium 1, the Infinium 2, and now they have an Infinium HD assay. Uh, shown here is uh, if the uh, uh, incorporation of um, uh, a T allele present that would hybridize perfectly, this would be an incorporated allele. Uh, the G allele would not be uh, incorporated because uh, it does not match to the A. Um, the single base extension uh, reaction is, uh, uh, is shown down here. Uh, because there are two colors available, um, not all SNPs can be represented uh, with the same uh, pair of the same labeling of the alleles, and so they'll use uh, some SNPs are represented by a single uh, bead type, and some SNPs are represented by two different bead types uh, uh, in, in the way that the assays are performed. The affymetric strategy, uh, uh, the allele discrimination is not due to that single base extension, it's due to hybridization. Uh, the general strategy uh, used there is that the, uh, the genomic DNA is, um, uh, is, is uh, digested through a restriction enzyme, a uh, pair of restriction enzymes actually, and then adapters are ligated onto the ends of the, uh, ends of the fragments. A single PCR primer can amplify across those uh, fragments to produce a larger uh, amount of that uh, total product compared to that initial uh, genomic DNA that was used. Then these fragments are, uh, um, these PCR products are um, fragmented and end labeled, and then these labeled products are hybridized to a chip. And the hybridization of the alleles um, uh, and is, is uh, set up with specific probes that allow the uh, two alleles to be discriminated from one another um, uh, uh, um, in the homozygous or the heterozygous state. Multiple copies of the uh, probes are present on the, um, on the gene chip probe array to allow the most specific uh, hybridization patterns to be detected. Uh, and to allow there to be some uh, redundancy of the signal detection. Uh, this increases the, the, um, the opportunity that the, uh, for, for more accurate uh, calling of those alleles. In choosing which uh, uh, panel to use or in choosing which strategy and which panel to use, uh, not only the uh, technique uh, the, the method of allele discrimination, but the content of the panels uh, can influence the, uh, the, uh, the results in terms of the proportion of the genome that is um, in the end assayed by this genome-wide strategy. Here shown are a, a set of different um, uh, products that are available from, um, from Affymetrix and from Illumina. Uh, these are the names of those uh, products. And um, using the, the proportion of common variation that is um, uh, either present on the chip or tagged through that haplotype tagging strategy on the chip is shown by this global coverage uh, statistic. That global coverage statistic is different for uh, uh, samples of different ancestral populations because of the strategies used by the uh, companies to select which variants uh, would be present on the chip. So, for example, uh, looking at uh, if you were performing a study of individuals with um, ancestry um, uh, from, uh, from Northern and Western Europe that would uh, perhaps be most similar to the CEU hap map population, then uh, the, um, the human hap 300 uh, product would cover or um, uh, be evaluating perhaps 77% of the uh, genome, whereas the SNP array 5.0 might be covering 64% of the variation. So it's a little bit independent or not, not completely dependent on the number of variants present on the chip. So it's important to think of not only the number of variants being analyzed, but um, what their coverage is. You can see that the products are, are a little bit different in terms of deciding between a pair of products if you were deciding between uh, th these two, for example, in the um, CEU population, this one has uh, better coverage than, uh, than this product, whereas in the 
uh, in the YRI populations, this product has better coverage than this one. These statistics are for global coverage, so the average across the entire genome, a portion of the common variation across the entire genome is captured by uh, that product. The local genomic coverage varies, however. So if there was a particular gene that you were particularly interested in, in terms of uh, showing evidence of association, it's possible that it's not captured at all by, the, uh, by these products. So the, the, um, this shows um, a stretch of uh, chromosome 17 along the x-axis, and the, um, the, the local coverage calculated in one megabase uh, regions and um, uh, moved over by 200 kilobase windows. And uh, there are um, uh, different colored curves that represent the different, uh, the different SNP chips that were evaluated. And you can see that uh, all of them vary in their, um, in their coverage. And there are some regions that are uh, very, very uh, poorly covered by many of the products, whereas other regions are, are better covered. So uh, just because it's a genome-wide association chip does not mean that uh, all possible genetic variation is being uh, is being analyzed, even amongst this common variation, there are regions that are better covered and worse covered by the different chips. So once that genotype data is obtained, so the DNA samples from all of those uh, cases and controls were members of that population cohort, uh, analyzed by one or uh, uh, one of those uh, genotyping products. It's important to perform stringent quality control. Um, failure to perform the quality control will lead to, likely lead to false positive associations due to uh, incorrect genotypes or uh, poor quality samples that are, uh, that, that uh, can influence the results really quite dramatically. So uh, many steps are used by, uh, to, to determine, to identify the potential problems and uh, uh, remove them. So for example, identifying poor quality samples, samples for which the success rate of SNPs is less than 95 percent as a, as a bit of an arbitrary threshold can indicate that the, uh, the genotypes that are present are actually less likely to be correct. So setting a relatively stringent threshold uh, allows poor quality genotypes to be, uh, to be removed. These might be samples that have um, some, uh, say, protein contamination or um, other, other, uh, um, uh, um, other qualities that make the uh, genotyping accuracy less, less, um, less good. Uh, samples can also be identified that have excess, excess heterozygous genotypes. This can indicate that that DNA sample is perhaps contaminated with another DNA sample, so that there are more positions where uh, uh, nucleotides are are, uh, appear to be heterozygous, perhaps, because they uh, come from the two different original DNA samples. Looking across large numbers of SNPs, it's, uh, the, the fraction of heterozygosity um, um, can be identified and can discriminate and, and detect sample contamination. These are large studies being performed in lots of samples, and there are lots of sample handling steps that are performed from the uh, 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 from, from the laboratory or from the steps of even collecting the, the, um, the blood or tissue sample from the individual. And so one way of detecting whether um, any sample swaps or sample switches have occurred is to, for example, look for um, incorrect, uh, uh, the, the, the sex determined by the X and Y chromosome markers not matching uh, the, um, the records from the um, clinical ascertainment. The genotype data can also be used to identify unex unexpected relatives present in, the, uh, present in the sample. As I referred to earlier in thinking about the cryptic relatedness, uh, so uh, one way to do this is to take all of the genotype data from all of the individuals and do pairwise comparisons of genotype similarity. So for example, if you found that two samples had entirely identical uh, genotypes are almost entirely identical genotypes. Well, that might be two DNA samples from the same person, or it might be identical twins present in the uh, present in the in the uh, data set. Uh, that that those two samples with the same genotypes would violate the uh, assumption of independence that the statistical tests require. Um, the the genotypes then also can be used to look for those measures of 
uh, population stratification to identify individuals that may have ancestry um, different from the rest of the sample. Uh, so in that, uh, in that goal of, of um, being able to identify uh, when the substructure is present because that substructure, especially in case control samples, can lead to false positive results, um, uh, identifying, characterizing what the likely ancestry of the individuals can help. Okay, so, so in addition to identifying and removing bad samples, um, okay, I'm going to start with uh, the, the SIPs also can show can be, need to be cleaned or need to be, the poor quality SNPs need to be recognized. So shown here are what some of the raw genotyping data, a cartoon of what the raw genotyping data for a few SNPs could look like. So shown on the axes here uh, is the signal intensity for an arbitrary allele, say the C allele, uh, and the signal intensity on the uh, Y axis for the other allele, and other arbitrary allele, let's call this the A allele. So. Uh, looking at a um, particular SNP and looking at a couple hundred individuals, this is a, a plot that could be observed. So there are some samples where the uh, signal intensity from the C allele is strong and the signal intensity from the A allele is relatively low. These individuals would be the CC genotype. Some individuals where the C, C intensity is low, the A intensity is high, these would be the AA genotype individuals. And somewhere there's um, intermediate levels of both the C and the A uh, intensity. So these would be the heterozygous CA uh, individuals. So the, the um, software exists to go through the raw intensity plots and to try to identify and assign the genotype uh, uh, labels to the individual samples that are present in the, uh, from that assay. And so here correctly assigned would be the CC, the CA, and the AA genotypes. Here's an example where the software where the, the uh, uh, genotypes nicely cluster into three different categories, but the software has inappropriately uh, called these two clusters as the same uh, heterozygous genotype. And so this would lead to, or could lead to, um, uh, incorrect uh, results and potentially a false, false positive or a false negative association uh, and could be corrected uh, if this could be detected that this two, uh, these two are different. Um, manual review of, of uh, genotype clusters when there are a million could take a very long time. So I've tried to identify the characteristics uh, that the software uses and to evaluate uh, which SNPs are most likely to um, have uh, incorrect uh, genotypes would help in trying to identify uh, um, genotyping errors such as this. Uh, uh, another category of uh, uh, poor quality genotypes is shown here. Now this, in this uh, example, the clusters of the genotypes uh, overlap some, and uh, uh, it's difficult for the software or if you're, for even a human to decide for uh, samples that are in this intermediate range whether they should be called as the uh, CC genotype or as the CA genotype. And in practice, what's likely to happen uh, is that the, the uh, genotypes would be removed for these particular individuals that are in the, uh, in the intervening space. Uh, there. Now, this can lead to uh, some bias um, because in this particular case, all of the individuals being removed are either uh, likely either homozygous or heterozygous for this particular allele. So we're not, uh, we are removing a specific subset of the, uh, of the alleles. This can lead to um, uh, uh, differences in the, um, if they're different, say, between the cases and controls, can lead to differences in the association statistic. So certainly the highest quality data is here. Uh, in this kinds of uh, uh, examples, we need to make the decision whether to remove a few genotypes and think that uh, most of the remaining genotypes are correct or whether to drop that SNP completely. Other quality control statistics help identify and remove um, bad SNPs. So if the genotyping success rate is less than 95%, so would identify um, cases like the one that I uh, just showed or would uh, say that perhaps that SNP uh, is the assay to detect that SNP is not as robust and is potentially when showing a genotype, not showing a correct genotype. Uh, often duplicate samples are included in the, uh, uh, in the genotyping assay so that their genotypes can be compared and um, uh, uh, SNPs for which the duplicates show mismatches can be removed. 
the um, expected proportions of genotypes can be, com uh, uh, can be compared with the observed allele frequencies. This is a test of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, to determine if the uh, SNP assay is perhaps incorrectly calling uh, homozygous or heterozygous. If trio samples are present, um, mom, dad, and a child, then looking for a correct inheritance of the alleles from, uh, in a child from the parents um, can be uh, identified, and, and um, errors in that inheritance can suggest that that SNP is being um, incorrectly called. Uh, and also differential missingness in the cases in the controls. Um, if, if a SNP is less, um, less well genotyped in the cases than in the controls, it could potentially indicate that there is some other underlying variant that, um, that is playing a role or, or, um, and could lead to um, incorrect results. Okay, so now the good quality uh, uh, SNPs and the good quality samples um, uh, have been identified. That data then is uh, used for tests of association. I show here uh, uh, the case control test of association, but uh, of course quantitative traits can be tested for association as well. Here in the uh, simplest example, we look for the number of individuals with the uh, three different genotypes at a given SNP, uh, the number present in the cases, the number present in the controls, uh, and uh, uh, test for uh, a trend of um, the presence of those genotypes being different between those two groups. Uh, this analysis performed, say, by uh, 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 test for trend or um, could be performed by a test of uh, logistic regression can include other covariates that may influence that outcome. So if age and sex are uh, uh, influence the disease of interest, then those can be um, adjusted for in the analysis. Um, other genetic models can be tested. Um, most often, uh, uh, um, studies are performed looking for um, additive effect of, of, of a risk variant. Dominant and recessive tests can be performed as well, although that's now increasing the number of tests being performed and they're not completely independent of each other. And uh, that larger number of tests would need to be accounted for in determining what the most uh, significant results um, are found. When thinking about a case control design, uh, uh, in addition to determining what the, <clears throat> what the p-value, what the statistical evidence of association is, the strength of that uh, association um, uh, needs to be quantitated. An odds ratio is a measure of effect that's uh, uh, um, often used when thinking about the, the uh, qualitative traits. So shown here is an example of calculating the, um, the odds ratio that um, uh, the measure of effect of that allele on the risk of developing disease. The alleles uh, present are counted, uh, how many A alleles are present, how many C alleles are present uh, in the cases and compared to the controls. And then um, the odds of having a C allele amongst the cases and the odds of having a C allele amongst the controls are compared to one another. And so that odds, that ratio um, of those odds can be calculated from the numbers uh, um, uh, and value determined here. So an odds ratio of one means that there's uh, no effect of that particular SNP on, on disease. An odds ratio of greater than one means that there's an increased effect. And if uh, a confidence interval is built around that odds ratio, then that can be used to, de to determine whether that, um, that increase is significant or not. So an odds ratio, uh, say the 95% confidence interval around that odds ratio can determine whether that increase is significant at the 0.05 level. Many SNPs are being tested for uh, association, often 300,000 or a million or more. Um, so it's important to correct for multiple tests. Uh, one way that this is um, often done is to um, set the threshold for p-value significance um, high so that um, uh, this, the evidence of association that would be found by chance is, um, uh, is not considered to be uh, a likely uh, uh, influential finding. Now, when the effect sizes are relatively modest, then um, uh, larger sample sizes are needed. So either there needs to be a big effect, a large effect of a particular variant that would, say, increase the odds ratio dramatically, or there need to be a lot of samples to allow uh, that significant result to be identified. 
often in um, genome-wide association studies of European populations, there's sort of a, um, a guideline that um, around a million SNPs are being evaluated. Uh, and so uh, a standard 0.05 p-value, uh, you know, the results would be seen by chance one in 20 times, adjusted for the number of uh, tests being performed, sets this threshold of approximately five times 10 to the minus eight as a p-value threshold uh, to try and achieve. Other populations that have more genetic variation um, would, be, would um, effectively be analyzed looking at more tests, and so the threshold would need to be more stringent. I'll show you some example data now from a, a genome-wide association study to explain that uh, uh, effective p-value. This was uh, from several years ago, the uh, first analysis that the, uh, uh, that the fusion study did looking for uh, evidence of association with type 2 diabetes. So now the um, genomic position of the SNPs is on the x-axis, uh, chromosomes 1 through 22 in the x, and the um, evidence of association, the p-value from the statistical test uh, shown on the y-axis. Now this is on the minus log 10 scale, so that the, um, the, the um, smaller p-values, the ones that show greater evidence of association, are higher up on the plot. So a standard uh, p-value threshold of 0.05 would be uh, down here on the plot. Anything above that line would be uh, a p-value better than 0.05. Clearly when doing the 300,000 tests that are shown here, that's not a satisfactory p-value to be determining um, evidence of association. There are way too many uh, results that were identified here by chance. Going forward, one strategy to try and figure out whether uh, the data are identifying uh, results that one might expect is to look for O positive control signals, uh, evidence of association that prior to beginning the genome-wide study uh, you might know to be true, perhaps from uh, candidate gene studies or from linkage analysis. When looking at this particular set of data, this is a little bit more than 1,100 cases and 1,100 controls, looked for the um, location of variants known previously to, uh, to, to be associated with disease. We were quite happy to see these variants here. Um, in the top 10 of the results were uh, one of the signals previously shown associated with diabetes. Here's another signal. It was maybe in the top few hundred of those uh, 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 tests of association. And here's another signal that we believed ahead of time. It's in the top few thousand of those signals. So this, uh, the initial results here uh, are showing evidence of association, but some of the true signals are buried amongst a lot of the noise, uh, the false positive associations due to chance. One way to assess the quality of that data and to look for evidence of uh, population stratification and to look for an excess of significant results is to perform a quantile-quantile plot. This is to take the p-values from that test of association, um, those that were observed, and plot them on the minus log 10 scale, and compare them to the, the p-values that would be expected from just a uniform distribution of p-values uh, plotted on the x-axis. So uh, in a case of no population stratification and a case of no um, interesting excess of significant results, you would see that the, the uh, points uh, for the SNPs aligned uh, on this uh, line right here. Uh, this is the data from that uh, previous slide and shows indeed that there's um, perhaps a little bit of excess signal, a little bit of the, the points falling uh, a little bit off the line here, but for the most part um, along the line. If there's evidence of a population substructure, the, uh, the set of p-values can all um, may result in uh, inflation across uh, across the entire range. So this plot shows uh, the p-values that might be obtained from a, a genome-wide association study where there is evidence of, of population substructure that's shown by these darker symbols here. You can see that they are um, um, falling off of the line of um, expected results uh, for, the in, for a large proportion of the, um, of the distribution. After adjusting those, uh, that data for the evidence of population substructure that was observed, those values might, uh, uh, should then get closer to that line of expectation. Now then, the, 
um, amount that those values are um, uh, um, off the, um, the line of expectation, at least at the most significant results, show the p values that might represent the SNPs that are interesting, show interesting evidence of association um, uh, present in that study. Here's an example to show what sample sizes might be needed to identify uh, particular genome-wide association signals. This is a set of uh, uh, genes and gene signals that um, have been reported for uh, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, myocardial infarction, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and the uh, power that would be available in, a, in say, a genome-wide association study of um, 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls. This is the chance of identifying uh, these variants uh, uh, using p-value thresholds of, say, 1 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, or uh, 0.01. So uh, for a uh, strong effect uh, variant, this signal here that was uh, relatively strong and has a relatively common risk allele frequency, this is the relative risk of that variant and the risk allele frequency, um, there's relatively uh, uh, good power to detect that signal of association. Another way of, of thinking of that is that um, to have a 95, to have a 90 percent chance of identifying this signal with a p-value less than 10 to the minus 8 would require um, 2,430 cases and controls. Now that's a signal that's relatively strong. Some of the other signals that have been identified, such as this um, uh, signal associated with type 1 diabetes, would require 54,000 cases and controls to identify uh, uh, that signal at a p-value of less than 10 to the minus 8. A key way to gain power uh, when performing a study is to uh, collaborate and combine the data with other available data sets uh, through collaboration. The most common way for, the, for uh, these collaborations to proceed is that each study, each group performs their own uh, genome-wide association. And then the data, the p-values, the effect sizes, or the odds ratios, the uh, um, overall results are combined from all the studies through a meta-analysis. Now potential issues that come to play when performing um, these analyses are, one, that different genotyping and analysis strategies are used. And another, that the case definitions might be different. So if, um, uh, if defining the disease is different, then um, the, the data might be combined and we might be losing power uh, through, that, uh, through that combination. In fact, the, the practice has shown that at least at this stage, uh, combining data from even if studies have defined diseases a little bit different, that the gain in sample size outweighs the detraction of um, uh, potentially defining those phenotypes a little bit differently. As we try and identify more and more variants, then defining phenotype more accurately uh, will become more and more important. Another issue, though, is that the uh, genotype platforms might be different between the, uh, between the different um, uh, uh, genome-wide associated, between the different studies. One strategy that has developed, a statistical strategy that has developed to uh, enable the uh, 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 data sets to be combined, um, also enables variants that were not genotyped to be uh, predicted in the samples. This is uh, imputation of genotypes and uh, is described uh, here. Say in your particular study sample, uh, here's an individual, there are two copies of a uh, chromosome and uh, there are three SNPs that are analyzed uh, in this uh, sample. There are other SNP positions nearby, but they are not being analyzed on that genotyping platform. Well, these can be, the genotypes observed here can be compared to a set of reference haplotypes. A uh, very common set of reference haplotypes to be used would be those developed from the um, uh, haplotype map project. So the, uh, where, where um, a number of individuals have been genotyped for a much larger, more comprehensive set of genetic variants, shown here. We I would identify and match the observed genotypes to haplotypes present in the reference. 
So for example, the uh, A alleles present on uh, this haplotype uh, are found to match this reference haplotype, whereas the alleles present on this haplotype are found to match uh, uh, this haplotype at first and then this haplotype uh, at a later position. Uh, the uh, identification of those matching haplotypes then allows um, statistically those, those, um, uh, those genotypes to be filled in with different degrees of certainty depending on how, uh, uh, depending on the presence, uh, what the range of present uh, haplotypes and what the possible haplotypes were in the reference data set. So this imputation procedure means that you can take the genotype data from uh, 300,000 variants, for example, and impute um, uh, perhaps 2 million DNA variants that are present in the haplotype map uh, reference uh, sample. Uh, most of the imputation algorithms come with a, um, uh, uh, a test or a, a measure of the accuracy or the expected accuracy of that imputation. So a threshold can be used to determine which are the most likely to be um, accurately imputed genotypes and that data retained for analysis whereas the less likely to be imputed accurately genotypes can be uh, removed. So this imputation facilitates um, uh, the meta-analysis or the combination of data from, uh, uh, from different data sets. So for example, if this is a, a stretch of, of chromosome present, the uh, one product, the Illumina 317K platform might have uh, SNPs tested at these positions, shown in black. The Affine Metrics platform uh, show, um, would have SNPs tested at these positions, shown in red. Uh, you can see that some of those positions overlap, but many of them don't. So if we were to try and uh, combine genotype data from uh, 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 present just with one study from um, typed on this platform, one study typed on this platform, we would have relatively few variants where um, the same variants were tested in both populations. However, if both studies were to perform imputation, then um, all of these variants uh, shown here present in HapMap uh, would be able to be analyzed by both studies and therefore able to be combined together by meta-analysis. So uh, shown here is a, uh, trying to represent uh, if the uh, one platform is testing this subset of variants, the other platform is testing this subset of variants, there's a relatively small overlap, but through imputation, um, a much larger set of variants, uh, including all of these and additional variants, uh, can be analyzed. Shown here is an example of a, a test of association where imputation allowed the signal to be identified. So along the x-axis is a portion of uh, chromosome 19, and you can also see some of the genes that are present uh, in this region, including the uh, low-density lipoprotein receptor uh, gene shown here in blue. Again, the minus log 10 p-value of the evidence of association with the trait um, LDL levels, low density lipoprotein cholesterol levels, uh, uh, shown here. And the variants that are present on the, um, the AFI 500K platform that were used in a pair of studies are shown in red. So the, the, the um, evidence of association that they observed with LDL cholesterol after genotyping uh, is shown by those uh, relatively sparse signals, none of which uh, uh, reach a threshold any better than a p-value of about 0.01. However, when imputation was performed, um, the, the variants that were present in HapMap but not genotyped were able to be uh, 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 imputed or predicted, tests of association performed, and you can see that um, there's a signal for a SNP here and a SNP here that uh, reached as high as, uh, uh, as good of a p-value as 1.7 times 10 to the minus 6. So strong evidence of association at the LDL receptor gene for the LDL phenotype, uh, this was a, a uh, would be a, a, um, uh, a positive uh, control uh, signal uh, was able to be identified because of imputation. Here's an example showing uh, what in practice um, how uh, uh, study design would look like for trying to combine uh, data together. So here's an example uh, from a paper published this year where uh, seven different groups performed genome-wide association studies for uh, cholesterol levels in their separate samples. Um, in total, those seven groups 
uh, have about 19, a little bit more than 19,000 individuals uh, represented that were scanned. From that meta-analysis data, the, uh, the SNPs that showed um, the strongest evidence of association, a uh, subset of those were identified. Um, uh, so between 40 and 70 SNPs were then able to be tested in additional uh, uh, cohort samples. So these are samples that did not perform the genome-wide association study themselves, but uh, uh, went in and genotyped that small subset of SNPs. So there are uh, five additional cohorts represented here, um, representing about 20,000 individuals. So those SNPs tested in these additional individuals, that data then can be analyzed together. So a sample size um, together of about 40,000 individuals to try to identify um, novel evidence of association. The results of that are shown here. Now there's three plots because there are three uh, um, uh, traits being analyzed. Uh, LDL cholesterol uh, shown here, chromosomes 1 to 22. Uh, HDL cholesterol shown here and triglyceride levels uh, shown here. And you can now see that uh, uh, compared to the signals that are down here in the noise that some signals are showing quite strong evidence of association with p-values as high as uh, 10 to the minus 40th. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on a portion of these to talk about the QQ plots that uh, correspond to this data. So here's a subset of the LDL cholesterol uh, data, the uh, set of chromosomes here. And you can see that, that uh, uh, some signals, um, that the signals are uh, colored a little bit differently. Um, this is, um, some are colored in blue. These are um, loci that had been previously reported. Not so many samples were needed to identify uh, the first set of associated signals. Uh, and so those are shown. So for example, apolipoprotein A protein B uh, association was known previously, whereas in this study, combining those sets of data together, um, some novel loci were identified, uh, uh, shown in green, uh, and were able to be replicated in that additional, um, those follow-up samples. Um, so those are labeled here. So for example, Tim B4. Some of those signals that were chosen, some of the SNPs chosen to be followed up in the uh, additional cohorts did not show evidence of association in those follow-up samples. So those are more likely to be representing false positive signals out of that genome-wide association study. The QQ plot then that's shown um, uh, shows what the evidence of association is for that whole set of data um, in comparison to the expected uh, distribution. The distribution observed for the LDL cholesterol p-values is uh, shown here uh, in black. Uh, one way to, to show what the signals were identified that were new is to uh, take this data and remove the p-values corresponding to signals that were previously known before the study was performed. And so that's shown in blue. Uh, you can see that there are still some quite strong uh, signals, and those are the ones that were reported new in this uh, particular, uh, 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 particular study. Uh, removing those, you can see that there still is a little bit of excess signal um, uh, um, uh, that, that, that is, uh, that, that, uh, that's detectable, that's um, uh, shown that's outside of the range of uh, what you would, uh, what would be expected uh, from just a uniform distribution. One of the problems that can come up or one of the uh, important steps of interpretation that's uh, needed when combining data together uh, is to consider potential heterogeneity between the studies. An example of this can be, uh, uh, is the um, signal that was identified first at the, um, at the FTO uh, uh, locus that was identified to be associated with type 2 diabetes by the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium. Now, it was a, a quite strong signal in that, in that data set. They compared uh, type 2 diabetes cases to um, uh, two different types of population-based uh, controls. Uh, when, when they compared their data to a couple other well-powered studies performed at the same time, the signal was mostly not observed in those other studies. When they went to look more carefully at that signal to try and determine what the, uh, uh, why that might be, what those differences might be, they noted that the Wellcome Trust case control cases of type 2 diabetes were more obese than the controls, whereas the other studies, 
had had more um, uh, ca diabetes cases in controls that were more similar for their um, amount of obesity. When the Wellcome Trust uh, group performed that test of association with diabetes, accounting for um, obesity or accounting for body mass index, the signal went away. That is, that the that they identified that the, the source of the heterogeneity between those diabetes studies was due to the association with body mass index. And they detected then by following up that signal association with body mass index that this was indeed a uh, strong uh, genetic variation uh, influencing uh, body mass index and obesity. It's uh, shown here the, uh, in the report from their uh, paper. So when they first looked at, and this is an odds ratio plot, so we're looking at the odds of obesity um, for a given variant at uh, this, this uh, particular SNP, looking at the A allele. So an odds ratio of one would mean that there was no evidence of association with obesity. The first sample that they looked at was those welcome trust uh, cases of type 2 diabetes, and they saw quite strong um, evidence of association with the, uh, quite strong odds uh, of 1.58 for um, uh, evidence uh, uh, for, for an obesity signal in comparison to the um, welcome trust case control, uh, the consortium controls, which are here. So you can see that when they were looking for um, evidence of type 2 diabetes, the fact that these samples were more obese than these um, was leading to an uh, association, evidence of association for type 2 diabetes when the effect was more direct on evidence of obesity. They followed this up to, con to, to confirm the evidence of association with obesity by looking at additional uh, uh, samples uh, from, of individuals with type 2 diabetes, additional controls, and additional members of population-based cohorts. And you can see that in each of these samples, the evidence of um, association, the odds ratio, is uh, greater than one. When the 95% confidence interval does not cross one, that means that it was significant at the uh, 0.05 level. So larger studies have uh, more focused uh, confidence intervals. Taken together, all of these data uh, uh, show that the um, odds ratio from the meta-analysis of all of these studies for obesity is an odds ratio of 1.32 uh, with a quite small uh, p-value. So heterogeneity can arise uh, from meta-analysis, uh, it's sometimes possible to discover the, the uh, basis for that heterogeneity. Okay, so, so um, the, uh, the genome-wide association studies have been quite productive in the past several years. Uh, this is a summary uh, um, of the uh, um, collected together at the um, uh, at, at, at NHGRI reporting um, signals where the p-value has been reported at less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8. If you uh, look back at the slide that uh, Lynn Jordy showed you, it was from a little bit earlier in 2009, and you can see that a, a larger number of signals uh, showed up even just in the, uh, in the six months between when that snapshot was taken and uh, when this one was created. This is representing from about November of uh, 2009. Uh, and these are, are signals from all sorts of uh, uh, diseases and traits that have been mapped to different positions around the genome. So what are some of the things that are identified, being identified from uh, genome-wide association studies? Well, first thing often that uh, folks will look for is whether um, known, known signals of association are observed in the data and can be replicated. So shown here is um, evidence of association with uh, LDL cholesterol levels for a SNP that's uh, present at the, uh, at the APOE signal. This one doesn't, isn't precisely the variant that, uh, one of the variants that, that influences um, uh, creation of the APOE4 allele, but it's in tight linkage disequilibrium with that. So that's a signal that's been long known to uh, uh, influence LDL cholesterol. It's observed here. But novel signals also are being identified, and this is the main goal for uh, 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 genome-wide association studies. So some, sometimes the novel signal is present within uh, the intron of a, uh, of a gene. Here's an example uh, shown here. The, uh, the coloring on these plots represents uh, the index SNP, the SNP that's often reported 
um, say, in a paper or, this, or the strongest signal that's uh, present in the uh, genome-wide association data, and then the other variants that are being inherited together in, um, uh, um, in similar patterns are colored based on their evidence of linkage disequilibrium using the statistic R-squared, so that the, the, the signals that are most strongly, that are the highest R-squared that are in strongest linkage disequilibrium with the top signal are shown in colors closer to red, and those that are uh, in uh, uh, lower linkage disequilibrium are shown uh, closer to blue. And if they're gray signals, those are ones uh, for which that LD st statistic is not known. So what you can see here is uh, evidence of association where all of the signals from, um, for the SNPs present in HapMap are contained uh, within an intron of this gene, CDKAL1. This is association with type 2 diabetes. Sometimes signals are identified that are completely outside of known uh, protein uh, coding genes. So here's shown a, a, a strong signal that's located more than 100 kilobases from any known protein coding genes, in this case, uh, CDKN2A and CDKN2B um, are, are, are pretty good candidates for this signal of type 2 diabetes. Um, it turns out there's also a non-coding RNA that uh, spans a portion of this region, um, and it's possible that that is, uh, uh, plays a role. Oops. In some cases, common variants are being identified near genes with known rare variants. Here's a, a case where um, a signal evidence of association with LDL was discovered for um, some variants that are located near the PCSK9 gene. Private mutations in PCSK9 have been found to show to change um, LDL cholesterol levels by uh, more than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, rare variants have been found to, um, with frequencies around 1 percent, can change LDL levels by about 16 milligrams per deciliter. The common variants being identified here, minor allele frequency, or the minor allele present in, uh, 20 percent of the time um, uh, in PCSK9 change LDL by uh, about 3 milligrams per deciliter. So some of the, what we're learning about some of the genetic architecture is that genes that have been identified for rare, uh, for rare Mendelian uh, um, disorders are um, also have some DNA variation that influences common uh, traits. It's also possible to be able to do the flip, the flip of that, and take variants that are identified uh, with common common vari genes identified or loci identified with common variants associated with the signal, and go try to identify if there are any rare variants that might be present in um, subsets of families where. Uh, disease appears to have more of a Mendelian form that might help confirm what the underlying gene is at a particular uh, GWA signal. More and more frequently, we're identifying that more than one signal, more than one um, set of variants that show association with a trait are present in a given uh, gene region. So. Um, that is, if we were to look at this evidence of association um, uh, with uh, HDL cholesterol in this portion of chromosome 15, if you were to ignore the colors for a moment, you would see that there are some, uh, there's signal here and there's signal here that show evidence of association. Well, it turns out that there are uh, likely two different variants underlying, uh, at least two different variants underlying this signal. If you color this signal based on the, the uh, linkage to equilibrium, the variants being inherited together are, um, are, are restricted to this uh, portion of the peak. If you color it instead by uh, this uh, signal, you can see that the variants being inherited together in a similar pattern are restricted to this peak. If you test for association with HDL uh, levels for a set of SNPs and account for the variation present uh, in, by SNPs in this peak, this variation remains, and vice versa. That's the uh, good test of the independence of those signals. So there are independent signals uh, present here, both of which appear to influence um, this, uh, this lip uh, both, both nearby this lipase gene that appear to influence HDL cholesterol levels. Now one set of these variants, um, there, are, there are variants in this signal that are uh, found at the promoter of this gene. Uh, that may be influenced the, um, the signal. The other set of variants are located at some distance upstream, so perhaps there's a, a longer range regulatory element being 
affected by uh, uh, one or more of the SNPs in this region that influences that same gene. The, the larger the sample sizes uh, are getting, the more and more we're identifying that there are multiple signals uh, present at a, a given locus. Another characteristic that uh, can be identified is that um, different populations uh, that have different um, patterns of linkage disequilibrium can be used to narrow in and focus on where a signal might be present. So shown here is um, evidence of association with height uh, across uh, a region of chromosome 20, um, and the signal is uh, relatively similar strength um, spanning uh, a relatively large uh, region here. This was a study performed in uh, individuals of uh, European ancestry, and the corresponding um, plot that's showing the evidence of linkage disequilibrium in the CEU population is shown here, and you can see there's a relatively large re set of variants that are being inherited in um, uh, similar patterns. Now, when SNPs chosen from this region were followed, the red SNPs uh, chosen from this region were followed up in an African-American population. Evidence of association was only observed for one of them uh, and not for uh, the other, showing that um, the signal was stronger here than here. When looking at the linkage disequilibrium pattern in the YRI population, you can see that there was evidence of um, uh, uh, more recombination events, perhaps, that have happened in this, uh, in this region, that the set of SNPs being inherited together in a more similar pattern is a, uh, more focused. And so this evidence of association restricted to one region um, perhaps narrows the signal um, that was present in the, in the other population. And in fact, the variant here uh, in this uh, particular gene here has been shown to have an effect on expression of that uh, gene. Another characteristic being identified is that some of the same genes are um, showing evidence of association with um, sometimes rather diverse traits. So here's a subset of uh, a list that was uh, uh, curated uh, together of genome-wide association signals. So for example, there are uh, variants near the PTPN22 gene that have been found to be associated, p-values less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8th, with Crohn's disease and separately with type 1 diabetes and separately with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, that type of a variant might suggest that there's a similar uh, underlying um, uh, inflammatory uh, um, immune component to, uh, to these different diseases, these different traits. Uh, uh, similar might be found in the uh, glucokinase receptor being associated with C-reactive protein, a cardiovascular inflammatory marker, uh, lipid levels, and waist circumference. These traits might be uh, related, and, and uh, it could be that, this vari that variants of this gene are um, either having a pleiotropic effect uh, or that uh, the influence is on one trait and that the tra uh, traits are correlated with one another, and so the um, evidence of association is observed with multiple traits. Sometimes the signals are being identified um, for genes and for traits that um, seem to have a lot less to do with each other, and so it'll be interesting to determine what the um, evidence of association is and whether those two signals observed for two, two different traits are really acting on the same gene or on different genes. And then um, bioinformatically, trying to figure out what type of variants are being um, identified by genome-wide association studies. Well, the vast majority of the variants are intergenic and intronic, because that's the, where the vast majority of variants are, are located. When um, uh, trying to determine whether there's a functional basis, if there are uh, particular classes of variants among those sets of variants that are associated uh, at a given locus, um, uh, uh, groups have tried to characterize um, bioinformatically the prediction of what those variants might do. So um, in one uh, uh, study shown here, they looked for, um, in the sets of DNA variants, whether there were annotations of, say, non-synonymous or a location in promoters or untranslated regions on other uh, sets of categories, and tried to determine whether there were um, the, the sets of variants um, we're more likely to include uh, variants that uh, are, for example, non-synonymous. So shown here is um, uh, a calculation that shows that the odds that um, particular trait-associated SNPs are overrepresented in the sets of non-synonymous sites 
uh, is, um, is increased over um, um, saying that there is no excess of non-synonymous variants. This excess is pretty strongly then tried to uh, remove the effect of any variants that are um, uh, non-synonymous or in high linkage disequilibrium with non-synonymous variants and still found that there is an excess of, and that's what the rest of these uh, points show, still show that there's an excess of variants that are present in uh, promoters, either at the, um, uh, um, um, it, with different definitions of promoters, suggesting that perhaps there are um, more variants that are non-synonymous and uh, promoter-like that may be uh, playing a role uh, uh, in some of these studies. This is a sort of a global statistic and really the true studies to try and determine what the functional signals are underlying the genome-wide association signals are going to require um, uh, biological experiments. Okay, so at this point, a small proportion of the variability in traits is being explained by uh, common variants. Shown here are a set of um, diseases. The number of loci that uh, were identified at the time of this um, uh, study that was done and the proportion of the heritability being explained by those loci. So for some traits such as um, age-related macular degeneration, five loci have been identified explaining a quite large proportion of the heritability, perhaps 50 percent of the heritable uh, uh, variation in disease is being identified by that relatively small number of genes, whereas for other traits, um, uh, uh, even with larger numbers of loci identified, a smaller proportion of heritability is being identified. So whether or not this information can be used in a clinical setting is going to be disease dependent on the, on the strength of the signals being identified. Um, one might try to uh, take the variants identified and try and look at the prediction of whether, whether um, using the variants can help predict uh, what the outcome of phenotype or disease might be. This is data shown for 12 variants that were associated with height and counting how many of those variants are present in different individuals and asking among the individuals that had uh, less than or equal to eight um, height increasing alleles, uh, what is their average height and comparing that to uh, individuals in the other categories, so individuals with 16 or more height increasing alleles uh, uh, were on average um, uh, say four uh, centimeters uh, taller um, uh, than those in the other category. So this is um, having a relatively uh, modest effect on um, overall uh, on overall uh, measures of height. So the usefulness of these data in clinical translation, the um, uh, variants are being identified uh, that show evidence of association with susceptibility. Um, the um, main uh, contribution is showing these novel biological insights and just, you know, even despite some of the effect sizes that might be quite small, they can still lead to clinical advances through pr the identification of potential therapeutic targets for identifying biomarkers that might help predict disease better, potentially envir de determining environmental factors that might um, influence and allow us to um, have uh, public health impact and being able to prevent disease. The other side of this, trying to use these variants to improve measures of um, individual um, uh, personalized medicine is perhaps going to be a little bit further behind uh, because um, relatively fewer variants are being, a relatively small proportion of the heritability is still being explained. However, these variants can potentially be used in, in diagnostics and prediction and um, maybe in determining what the ideal um, uh, therapeutic treatment, what the ideal treatments are for particular individuals. Okay, so in summary, we talked our way through genome-wide association study design uh, and the quality control measures, the need for uh, very large samples to identify uh, smaller signals, but, and, and uh, sets of successful uh, loci that are being identified. Uh, <clears throat> and that finding an association signal doesn't immediately uh, tell us about uh, uh, clinical utility and doesn't immediately tell us about the biology, although the functional studies that uh, follow on to these can help identify novel pathways and genes being uh, relevant to traits. In the future of genome-wide association studies, more and more loci are going to continue to be identified 
as larger and larger sample sizes are evaluated through meta-analysis. In addition, the signals uh, to date have often been um, uh, the number of SNPs that are chosen for follow-up in replication samples has been relatively modest, and as more and more signals can be followed up in larger numbers of samples, uh, additional loci will be identified. Panels will be developed with lower frequency variants to allow a greater proportion of the variation to be, um, to be assayed. Uh, more diverse populations need to be analyzed because they uh, can show different uh, power, either through different allele frequency of the underlying variants or different uh, environmental contexts that would show different uh, uh, genes to be playing a role. Um, other types of sequence variants, such as copy number variants, are going to be analyzed uh, better. Phenotypes can be defined more accurately to be identifying uh, genes related to it, and then uh, the interactions between those genes and the environment uh, will be identified. And in all, the outcomes of these studies are going to be influenced by the ability to identify the molecular and biological mechanisms underlying the associations. Thank you very much for your attention.